Exercise 1. Good morning. Please take a seat. How can I help you? Well, I'm thinking of buying a new car and I'd like some advice. Sure, yes. Had you got any particular make in mind? I'm interested in a leader. I've had one before and liked it, but I haven't really made up my mind. Sure, we've got various models. Um, right, what about the engine size? Any ideas? Uh, the one I've got at the moment's a 1.2 litre engine, but I find it a bit slow on long journeys. Mm. I'd like a bit more power this time. A 1.4 should do. I don't think I need a 1.6 or anything. Right. Well, I think the model you're looking at is the Max. Hmm. Here's a picture. Oh, yes. Have you got one in? Yes. I'll take you to have a look at it in a minute. I'll just get a few more details. Uh, is there anything else to do with the engine? What kind of gear change do you want? I presume you want a manual. I'd want automatic. I've never driven a car with manual gears. Right. Well, now, here's the colour chart for the Max. Have you given that any thought? Oh, this blue's very popular at the moment. Yes, it is nice. I like blue. Um, what's it called? Royal? Yes. Hmm. But actually, I think I prefer this lighter shade here. Sky. Yes, that's popular too. I think I'll go for that. You might have to wait a week or so for that colour, but I assume that'll be OK. Oh, yes, fine. Well, we can go outside and you can have a good look at one and perhaps take it out. Mm. But first, can I just ask you about finance? The cash price is going to be somewhere in the region of 7500 How would you like to pay? Are you in a position to pay cash or would you need credit? I'd like credit, provided the terms are reasonable. Well, you can discuss that with my colleague in a moment. We have various arrangements. And um, would you be interested in us taking your present car as part exchange? Yes. OK, fine. So I'll just need some details from you and then we can do a valuation. Is that OK? Fine, yes. Could I have your full name? Wendy Harries. That's H-A-R-R-I-E-S. And is that Mrs? Miss? Ms? It's Doctor, actually. Oh, right. And your address? 20 Green Banks. Is that green spelled as in the colour? Yes, that's right. OK. Alton. Is that O-L-T-O-N? Not quite. It begins with an A, not an O. Oh, yes. That's in Hampshire, isn't it? That's right. And do you know your postcode? Uh, yes, it's G-U-8-9-E-W. Do you have a daytime phone number? Well, I work at the hospital, but it's a bit difficult to get hold of me. I can give you a number just for messages, and then I'll get back to you when I can. Is that OK? That's fine. It's 0798 257 643. Fine. And about the car you have now, what make is it? It's a Conti. Do you know the year or the model name? I think... I think it's 1996 and it's called a lion, like the animal. Then it must be 1994 because they brought out the fox after that. Oh, right, yes. Mileage, roughly? I'm not sure. I know it's less than 70,000. OK. What colour is it? It's grey, metallic grey. Right. And one last thing, what sort of condition would you say it's in? I'd probably describe it as reasonable. Do you need to see it? It's parked outside. Not at the moment, no. Perhaps you could call in one day next week. Exercise 2. As I said earlier, there is, I think, at Rexford an excellent combination of physical and geographical advantages. As well as having a rural setting and still being close to central London, Something that will certainly be of interest to you is that Rexford is just 35 minutes from London Airport. At Rexford, we have a strong research capability. We came seventh out of 101 universities in last year's research assessment, carried out by a government body, and did particularly well in your particular subjects, engineering and science.
Actually, we got a top research grade of five for engineering, geography and computer sciences. One further point, and I know from talking to you individually that a number of you may be looking for some experience in industry after the course, is that all our science and engineering research departments have unusually close relationships with industry in the area. Anyway, that's enough sales talk from me. I'll just take a sip of this coffee that's just arrived, thank you, and then I'll say something about what actually happens when you apply. Right, now, if you do decide to make an application, what you do is send it directly to me in my department. I will then immediately send confirmation and the application process begins. And I'd like to say at this point that you shouldn't worry if this process doesn't work all that quickly. I mean, occasionally there are postal problems, but most often the hold-up is caused by references. The people you give as referees, shall we say, take their time to reply. Anyway, it's absolutely normal for this process to take three to four months. What I do in this period is keep in touch with you and reassure you that things are moving along. One of the ways we've devised to help you decide about applying, as well as later when you've been accepted, hopefully, is to put you in contact with, if possible, a student from your own country who is at present studying with us. What you can do is phone them up, we will of course liaise between you, and discuss your concerns with them. That way, you can get an objective opinion of what you can expect if you come to live and study at Rexford. Not only the academic atmosphere, but important details like what the leisure facilities are like and whether the English weather and food are really as awful as everybody says. No. <laughs> if you decide you can face it, the contact can also help you just before you face it the contact can also help you just before you are from this country. At the moment, I think we've got two second-year students and one postgraduate from this country. Now, to move on to the other concerns you expressed earlier. At a UK university, and at a time when you will be separated from your normal surroundings, and learning is the norm, which takes most students a while to adjust to, and at a time when you will be separated from your normal surroundings, and in most cases, your family. This can be a difficult time. But remember that something like 25% of our student body are international students like yourselves, and that there are several organisations in the university and city whose main purpose is to offer help and ensure that your time with us is enjoyable and useful. One or two of you touched on the subject of accommodation earlier, so I'll just add a few points. It is the university's policy to give priority in the allocation of residence places to three categories. And those are visiting students, exchange students and new postgraduate students. However, demand exceeds supply, so there is still a need to put your name down early for campus accommodation, particularly if your family is accompanying you. This means that the earlier you decide whether you want to study with us, and so get the procedure moving, the better it will be for everybody. Um, yes? Uh, what if you would prefer to live outside the university? If you're planning to live off campus, you've got to sort things out even earlier. As with everything in short supply, the good accommodation gets snapped up months before the beginning of term. In other words, if you're starting in October, you need to be thinking about it in June, or at the very latest July. So you do need to think very carefully about what you need, how much you can afford to pay well in advance. What you can't do is leave it until a few days before the start of term. The agencies in town are pretty good. It's just a matter of contacting them in good time. Of course, we have a full-time accommodation officer available to help all students. She'll get in touch with you when you're accepted. She's got plenty of contacts in the town and will deal with the agencies on your behalf. One or two of you asked me earlier about your level of spoken English. Obviously, most of you have already achieved a lot. I wish I could speak your language half as well. Having said that, though, I'm afraid the lecturers will make little or no allowance for the presence of non-native speakers in the audience. 
So anything you can do to improve your spoken English, even beyond the pretty high levels most of you have already reached, will help make your stay with us that bit more fun for you. Some extra practice before you arrive is worth more than, for example, private lessons afterwards when you won't really have time. Oh, and one last thing before I invite further questions. It's very important that you... Exercise 3 Oh, Ben, I just remembered I never filled in that form for Nick. Ah. Did you do it? The course feedback form? Yes. If you want, we can do it together. I've got mine here. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Let's have a look then. What do we have to do? Let's fill in the top first. Let's see. Course. Course code. Uh, it's communication in business. Okay. Communication in business. I do know that, but what's the code? CB16 something. CB162, isn't it? Mm, that's it. Okay. And dates. When did we start? I remember my birthday's on May 4th, and it was the day after. It must have been May 5th. Gosh, doesn't seem that long ago, does it? No. And we finish at the end of this week on Friday, so that's uh, July 15th. Uh, 16th. Oh. Mon Monday was the 12th. Yeah. Right, that was the easy bit. <laughs> now, let's have a look. Mm. Please mm. give your comments on the following aspects of the course. OK, what's the first one? Oh, course organisation. Mm. What do you think? Uh, clear. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the organisation was clear. Mm. OK, anything else for course organisation? Um, it was a good thing he gave us the course outline at the beginning, in the first session. That was useful, so I'll put that down, shall I? Yeah. Now, going on to suggestions for improvement, one thing that wasn't so good, I think we could have done a bit more work at the beginning. I mean, at the beginning, it seemed dead easy. Yeah. I thought it was going to be really easy, and then all of a sudden in the second half of the course, we got a whole load of work, yeah. reading to do and essays and things. Yeah, it'd be better if it was more even. Mm. OK, now course delivery. Does that mean teaching? Yeah, I suppose so. Well, what I thought was really good on this course was the standard of teaching. Actually, I mean, some of the teachers were better than others, yeah. but the standard generally was fine. Much better than other courses I've been on. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Let's put that then. Okay. What about suggestions for improvement? I... I didn't think it was all that wonderful when we had great long group discussion sessions that went on for hours and hours. <laughs> right. I don't mean we shouldn't have group discussions, just that they shouldn't go on too long. Now, on to materials and equipment. Oh, now, what was good about some sessions was the handouts. Yes, I thought all the handouts were good, actually, and some were great with website addresses and everything. Mm. One problem, though, with materials was the key texts. Yes, there just weren't enough copies on reserve in the library. And if you can't get the key texts before the session, how are you supposed to do the reading? Yeah. And not enough computers. You have to wait ages to get one. OK, testing and evaluation. Well, I don't know. It's hard to say until we've got our written assignments back. Oh, don't talk about it. I only got mine in yesterday. It was a real struggle. Oh, I hate to think what mark I'll get. Yeah, but at least we've done the oral presentation. Mm. I thought that was good, the way I got my feedback really quickly. Yes, it was. And I liked the way we knew what would be evaluated on. We knew the criteria, so we knew we had to think about clarity, organization, and so on. Yeah, but I'm not so sure about the written work. Mm. One thing, I think, is that there's just too much. It's really stressful. Oh, yes, I'd agree. And I don't see why they can't let us know the criteria they use for marking. The written assignments? But he told us. No, for the final exams. Oh. What are they looking for? What are the criteria? What makes a pass or a fail? Yeah, I never thought of that. It'd be really useful. Mm. OK. Any other comments? I thought student support was excellent. Yeah, me too. OK. Excellent. Other comments? No, I can't think of anything else. Mm, nor me. OK, so that's done. Thanks, Ben. No, thank you. 
Exercise 4. Well, my group has been doing a project on how household waste is recycled in Britain. We were quite shocked to discover that only 9% of people here in the UK make an effort to recycle their household waste. This is a lower figure than in most other European countries and needs to increase dramatically in the next few years if the government is going to meet its recycling targets. The agreed targets for the UK mean that by 2008 we must reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by 12.5% compared with 1990. And recycling can help to achieve that goal in two main ways. The production of recycled glass and paper uses much less energy than producing them from virgin materials. And also, recycling reduces greenhouse gas emissions from landfill sites and incineration plants. As part of our project, we carried out a survey of people in the street. And the thing that came up over and over again is that people don't think it's easy enough to recycle their waste. One problem is that there aren't enough drop off sites, that is, the places where the public are supposed to take their waste. We also discovered that waste that's collected from householders is taken to places called bring banks for sorting and bailing into loads. One problem here is taking out everything that shouldn't have been placed in the recycling containers. People put all sorts of things into bottle banks, like plastic bags and even broken umbrellas. All this has to be removed by hand. Another difficulty is that toughened glass used for cooking doesn't fully melt at the temperature required for other glass, and so that also has to be picked out by hand. Glass is easy to recycle because it can be reused over and over again without becoming weaker. Two million tons of glass is thrown away each year. That is, seven billion bottles and jars. But only 500,000 tons of that is collected and recycled. Oddly enough, half the glass that's collected is green, and a lot of that is imported. So more green glass is recycled than the UK needs. As a result, new uses are being developed for recycled glass, particularly green glass. For example, in fiberglass manufacture and water filtration. A company called CLF Aggregates. Makes a product for roads, and 30% of the material is crushed glass. For recycling paper, Britain comes second in Europe with 40%, behind Germany's amazing 70%. When recycling started, there were quality problems, so it was difficult to use recycled paper in office printers, but these problems have now been solved. And Martins, based in South London, Produces a range of office stationery which is 100% recycled, costs the same as normal paper, and is of equally high quality. But this high quality comes at a cost in terms of the waste produced during the process. Over a third of the waste paper that comes in can't be used in the recycled paper, leaving the question of what to do with it. One firm, PaperSave, currently sells this to farmers. As a soil conditioner, though this practice will soon be banned because of transport costs and the smell, and the company is looking into the possibility of alternative uses. Plastic causes problems because there are so many different types of plastic in use today, and each one has to be dealt with differently. Packrite recycles all sorts of things, from bottles to car bumpers. And one of its most successful activities is recycling plastic bottles to make containers which are used all over the country to collect waste. The Save a Cup scheme was set up by the vending and plastics industries to recycle as many as possible of the three and a half billion polystyrene cups used each year. At the moment, 500 million poly cups are collected, processed, and sold on to other businesses such as Waterford, which turns the cups into pencils, and Johnson and Jones, a Welsh based firm, which has developed a wide variety of items, including business cards. Well, to sum up, there seems to be plenty of research going on into how to reuse materials. But the biggest problem. Is getting people to think about recycling 
instead of throwing things away. At least doing the research made us much more careful. Exercise 5. Good morning. How can I help you? Good morning. Um, I understand you help fix up students with host families. That's right. Are you interested in.、Uh... Yes. Well, please sit down and I'll just take a few details.、Uh, thank you. Right. Now, what name is it? Jenny Chan. Can you spell that, please? Yes. J E N N Y C H A N. Right. And what is your present address? Sea View Guest House, 14 Hill Road. Okay. And do you know the phone number there? Yes, I, I have it here. Um, two two three seven six seven six. But I'm only there after about seven p.m. So when would be the best time to catch you? I suppose between nine and, let me see, half past before I leave for the college. Great. And can I ask you your age? I've just had my 19th birthday. And how long would you want to stay with the host family? I'm planning on staying a year, but at the moment I'm definitely here for four months only. I have to get an extension to my permit. You're working on it?、Mm. Fine. And what will be your occupation while you're in the UK? Studying English. And what would you say your level of English is? <laughs> um. Good, I think. I'd like to say advanced, but my written work is below the level of my spoken, so I suppose it's intermediate.、Mm, certainly, your spoken English is advanced. Anyway, which area do you think you would prefer? Um. Well, I'm studying right in the centre, but I'd really like to live in the northwest. That shouldn't be a great problem. We usually have lots of families up there, and do you have any particular requirements for diet? Well, I'm nearly a vegetarian, not quite. Shall I say you are? It's probably easier that way. <laughs> that would be best. Anything about your actual room?、Uh, I would prefer my own facilities, en suite. Is that right?、Mm -hmm. And also, if it's possible, a TV. And I'd also like the house to have a real garden, rather than just a yard, somewhere I could sit and be peaceful. Is that all? Well, I'm really serious about improving my English, so I'd prefer to be the only guest, if that's possible. No other guests. Yes, you get more practice that way. Anyway, obviously, all this is partly dependent on how much you're willing to pay. What did you have in mind? I was thinking in terms of about sixty to eighty pounds a week, but I'd go up to a hundred if it was something special. Well, I don't think we'd have any problems finding something for you. Oh, good. And when would you want it for? I'd like to move in approximately two weeks. Let me see. It's the tenth today, so if we go for the Monday, it's the twenty-third of March. Yes. Right. Good. And if I could ask one last question. Exercise six. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to the soccer club meeting. It's good to see so many parents and children here tonight, and I know you're looking forward to a great football season. Now, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about some changes to the soccer club for the coming season. Now, this season. We'll be playing all our matches for both the junior and senior competitions at Kings Park instead of Royal Park, which was used last season. Now, for meetings, we're going to use the clubhouse in Kings Park, and the next meeting will be held in the clubhouse on the second of July. As usual, we hope to begin the season with a picnic next Saturday at the clubhouse. Please try and come to the picnic, as it's always good fun. At the last week of the season, we usually have a dinner and presentation of prizes to the players. And more information about this will be given to you later in the season. This season, we have more teams than ever. 
We hope to have ten teams instead of five in the junior competition and they will play on Saturday mornings beginning at 8.30am. Training sessions will be held in Kings Park on Wednesday afternoons for the juniors and they will be wearing red shirts again this year. In the senior competition, there will be four teams, same as last year, and their games will be played on Saturday afternoons starting at 2.30. At, oh, no, uh, sorry, it will be at a two o'clock start and the training session for seniors is planned for Sunday afternoons. Now, I'd like to introduce you to the new committee for the soccer club for this season. Uh, firstly, let me welcome Robert Young, the new president, who will manage the meetings for the next two years. Robert's son has been playing football with the club for over five years now, and uh, many thanks to Robert for taking on the job of president. Next, we have... Gina Costello. She's the treasurer and she'll collect the fees from you for the season. Uh, please try and give Gina your fees as early as possible in the season as the club needs the money to buy some new equipment. Then there's David West, who's volunteered to be the club secretary and one of the many jobs he'll have is to send out newsletters to you regularly. If you have any information that may be useful, please let David know so that it can be included in these newsletters. Also, I'd like to introduce you to Jason Dokic, who is the head coach. For all the new members here tonight, this is the third year that Jason has been with us as head coach, and we're very lucky to have such an experienced coach and former player at our club. He will continue to supervise the teams at training sessions and on match days. Now, before we finish and have some uh, refreshments, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask the new committee? Exercise 7. Right, Jason and Karen. Now, I asked you to look at the case study for Box Telecom as part of your exam assessment. It's interesting because they're in the middle of problems at the moment and I want you to track how they deal with them. Um, let's start with you, Karen. Having read through the case study, can you just summarise what the problems were that Box Telecom had to take on board? Um, yeah. Um, well, of course, what first came to their attention was that despite a new advertising campaign, they were suffering from falling sales. And this is something that had many causes. On top of that immediate problem, what had also happened over the last two years was that although they had invested in an expansion plan, they had to face up to increased competition. And before they had a chance to get to grips with the effects of that, they were stalled by a strike. And it was just when they were thinking about making a colossal investment in new machinery for their plants. So they were really in trouble. Yes, I think that's fair. And, Jason, um, now you contacted the company, didn't you? Oh. What did the company define as the reasons for these problems? Well, I think they've hit on the right things. It would be easy to say they had invested too heavily or at the wrong time, but in fact the signs were good, and what they were set back by was high interest rates. Mm. At the same time, their longer-term problems, which were affecting their market share, were eventually credited to poor training. And having looked at the details in their last report, I think that's right. So, on to the larger issues then. Karen, what do you think the company will do? Oh, well, obviously they have the choice of accepting the very favourable terms that another company, KMG PLC, have given them to buy them out. That would mean creating a new company with a new image. Or they could decide on a bolder move and offer some new shares if they wanted. But I think they're much more cautious than that and expect they will start trying to find individuals who'd be prepared to back them with some of the capital they need. Well, you mustn't always assume that dramatic problems require dramatic solutions. <laughs> Sometimes there's a simple fix, such as changing the guy at the top. If they truly are cautious then I suspect they will seek to shut down some of their shops. But a more ambitious approach, and one which I think would have more chance of success, would be to alter how they're running things, the management layers and the processes. So, in your analysis, try to think of all the options, 
Jason? Yes, it's interesting because I found it a really useful company to study. Its problems cross all types of industries, and it's lucky it's so big. A smaller or even medium-sized company would have gone under by now. Ah, well, in fact, what I want you two to do is to go away when we've finished our discussion today and write a report. We've looked in general at the telecommunications market in the UK over the last few sessions, and I want you to take Box Telecom as an example and suggest some ways in which they might overcome their problems and outline the reasons why you think as you do. But try and keep it intrinsic to the company rather than dragging in other examples. Is that OK, Karen? Yes, I think I can do that. Personally, I've got great hopes for it. I think it will recover. That advertising campaign they did was very strong and they're very innovative with their products. They set new trends. The company's got to recover, don't you think, Jason? Mm, I'm not sure. I think it can, but it's not a foregone conclusion unless they manage to attract the right level of investment. The company definitely needs a boost and to attract more highly skilled workers if their recovery is to be long-lasting. When I was talking to the marketing manager, he said to me that he thinks the company had got a great management team. But he would say that, wouldn't he? <laughs> but they are suffering from having to work with outdated production machinery, and that could cost a lot to put right. Well, personally, I think the stock market is to blame. I think they were expecting too much of the company, and then inevitably it looked bad when it didn't perform. The market should have had more realistic expectations. And I disagree with you about the advertising campaign, Karen. That's where they could do with some innovation to get sales kick-started. Anyway, let's see what you come up with. with those. Exercise 8. OK, are you all settled? Well, first of all, welcome to Cardiff University. I'm here to explain what we can offer you. Now, as a new student at the university, you will probably need some sort of guidance to help you to use the library effectively to study and research. Some of you have asked about a guided tour, but we find this rather muddles people. So, in this first week, we run a series of talks which focus on different aspects of the library and its resources. You'll also find that to get the most out of the library, you really do need to be computer literate. And so all this term, we run small classes, which will bring you up to speed on how to access the computer loaded information. OK, now let me give you an outline of what's available to you. You'll find that the computers are increasingly used as a research tool. Many students do most of their research on the Internet and the library computers are permanently online. Having found what you need, you'll find you can readily save texts on your personal computer space to print off when you need. You might think that it is the fastest way to get information, but the links can be slow. Clearly, you can find lots on there, but much of it is useless information, as it is from highly debatable sources, so be critical. You'll also find that the library has loaded several CD-ROMs onto the computers from specialist reference sources, such as the MLA. It means we can expand what we offer you at very little extra cost and saves us having to invest in more and more books. The CD-ROMs contain exactly the same information as the reference books, as the two are updated together. Now, most of you will need to refer to journal articles in your work, and you'll find you can also access these online, and we encourage you to do so. Clearly, some of you will find the printed version more accessible as it sits on the shelves, but I'm afraid the intention is to phase these out eventually. However, you will still be able to print off a version of the text rather than photocopying the journal pages. So you must get used to working online. Naturally, we do still have the full range of classic reference books, additional to the CD-ROMs for you to use, and there are several copies of each one. This is because some of you may prefer to borrow a book rather than sit in the library. There is a restricted loan time on these so that they are not missing from the shelves for too long. Although there is a section manager for each part of the library, they are very busy. And so, if you do get stuck looking for things, you should ask the relevant cataloguing assistant. As your training supervisor, I just oversee your induction and will not be around after this initial week.
Some of you may be interested to know that the library is offering specialised training sessions on writing a dissertation. Obviously, this is not relevant to those of you who are undergraduates, it is just for postgraduates. Your department will discuss the planning stage of the dissertation, i.e. what you're going to do with you, and we will focus on the structure of it. However, the training will also include some time on the computers. I realise most of you know how to organise files, but we can show you the different ways to run data programs. Your tutors will tell you at the outset how to set out the chapters they require, but you will need to ask them how they would like you to organise the bibliography, because it varies depending on your subject area. When you've got something together, the trainer here will look through the draft version for you to see if it's OK. And one final point, for those of you who have registered from abroad, we can offer individual sessions on dissertations if you feel you need them. If you require language lessons, then they are available from the International Centre next to the Law Department. Exercise 9 Good afternoon, Dreamtime Travel. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm interested in the holidays you offer along the coast near here. Yes, we operate several tours up the coast. Where in particular did you want to go? Well, I like the sound of the holiday that mentioned whales. Was it um, whale watching? Oh, that's our whale watch experience. It's very popular and it's based in a lovely little town with nice beaches. Oh, right. And how long does it last? It's two days. That includes four hours travel time each way from here. Good. I don't want to be away any longer than that. So, is that by coach? Actually, it's by minibus. We like to keep those tours small and personal, so we don't take a whole coachload of people. In fact, we only take up to 15 people on this tour, although we do run it with just 12 or 13. Oh, right. So, do you run these tours often? Well, it depends on the time of year. Of course, in peak times, like the summer holidays, we do them every weekend. But at the moment, it's usually once a month at most. And when is the next one going? Hmm, let me see. Uh, there's one in three weeks' time, which is April the 18th, and then we don't have another one until uh, June the 2nd. All right. Um, and is April a good time to go? Pretty good, though the really good time is later in the year. I have to say, though, that the whale sighting is only one of the many things offered. Really? Yes. The hotel itself where you stay has great facilities. It's called the Palisades. Uh, the Paris what? No, it's actually the Palisades. P-A-L-L-I-S-A-D-E-S. -L -L it's right on the main beach there. Oh, I see. All of the rooms have nice views and the food is really good there too. Oh, right. And what about the other things? Um you know, that are included in the price. Oh, there are lots of things. But if you don't want to do the Whale Watch cruise, your guide will take anyone who is interested either on a bushwalk through the National Park near the hotel, and there's no extra charge for that, or on a fishing trip. That's an extra $12, I think. And there's also a reptile park in town. That costs more or less the same. No, I think I'd prefer whales to snakes. Yeah, and if you just want to relax, you're free to sit by the hotel pool or go down the beach. Oh, and they also have tennis courts at the hotel, but you have to pay for those by the hour. But there are table tennis tables downstairs, and they're part of the accommodation package. Just speak to your guide. Well, that sounds good. Um, so how much is the basic tour price? At this time of year, it's usually around $300, but let me check. Um... Oh, it's actually $280. And the next tour, are there any places on that one? How many people is it for? There are two of us. Yes, that should be fine. Can I just mention that we require all bookings to be made at least 14 days before you travel to avoid cancellations of tours? And if you cancel within seven days of departure, you will have to pay 50% of your total booking. OK. And you also need to pay a 20% deposit at the time of booking. Can I pay that by credit card? Yes, you can.
All right. Uh, what I'll do is I'll talk to my partner and get back to you. Fine. So I'll make a provisional booking, shall I? Two for the Whale Watch experience. Let me issue you with a customer reference number for when you call back. Do you have a pen? Yes. Okay. It's three nine seven four five T. That's T for Tango. When you call back, ask to speak to the tour manager. That's me, Tracy. Fine, I will. Exercise ten. Hello and welcome to today's Buyer Beware program, where we give you some tips on how to spend your money wisely. Now, in today's show, we're looking at beds for children and babies. Let's start by looking at baby cots. That's for children of up to three years old. We tested three different cots, all in the budget price range, and as usual, we will feature the good points, the problems, and our verdict. The first cot we looked at was by Baby Safe, and it had several good points to recommend it. Our testers liked the fact that it had four wheels, so it was easy to move around. The only slight problems with this cot were that it had no brakes, but they didn't think that mattered too much. At first, they were a bit concerned about the side bar because they felt babies could trap their fingers in it, but our testers felt that this was unlikely to happen, so they've given this one a verdict of satisfactory. The next cot was by Choice Cots, and this time our testers were pleased to find a cot which is simple to put together, unlike others we looked at. On the minor side, our testers did not like the fact that the side of the cot did not drop down, making it difficult to pick up newborn babies. However, the real problem with this cot was the space between the bars. Our testers found they were too wide, and a baby could easily trap his head. We felt this was a real safety hazard, and so we've labelled this one dangerous. I'm afraid. And finally, better news for the mother's choice cot. This cot was slightly different in that, although the side bar did not drop down, the base could be raised or lowered into two different positions, making it safe as well as convenient. The negatives for this one were quite minor. The only niggle everyone had was the fact that it has no wheels, and the only other problem anyone could find was that there were pictures, which were simply stuck on and so could easily become detached. The makers have now promised to discontinue this practice. As this cot will then be safe in every way, we have made the Mother's Choice cot our best buy. Congratulations, Mother's Choice! So, what features should you look for in a baby's cot? Well, obviously, safety is a very important factor, as well as comfort and convenience. We recommend that if you are buying a cot, do make sure that any metal present is not rusted or bent in any way. You should ensure your cot has only rounded or smooth edging without any sharp edges. This is especially important for wooden cots. And now, on to beds for toddlers. Exercise eleven. Excuse me, I was told to come here for advice about、um, management diploma courses. You've certainly come to the right place. Hi,、uh, my name is Monica. Nice to meet you. My name is Andrew. Andrew Harris. So, Andrew, have you seen our diploma course prospectus yet? Yes, I've already looked at it. In fact, I thought the information on course content was really useful, but I'm afraid I'm a bit confused by all the different ways you can do the course: full-time, intensive, part-time, and so on.、Mm -hmm. Well, let's see if I can help. I think each course type has its advantages and disadvantages, so it really depends on you, your own study habits, and your financial circumstances. Of course, are you working at the moment? Yes, I've been working in the administration section of the local hospital for the last three years,、mm -hmm. and before that, I worked in the office of a computer engineering company for two years. So I've got about five years of relevant work experience,、mm -hmm. and what I'm hoping to focus on is personnel management. I see. And are you planning to leave your current job to study, or are you thinking about just taking a year off? I want to know what my options are. Really, I don't want to quit my job or anything, and my employers are keen for me to get some more qualifications. But obviously, it would be better. If I could do a course without taking too much time away from work, right. 
So you don't really want to do the full-time course, then? No, not really. It's also a question of finances. You see, my office have agreed to pay the cost of the course itself, but I would have to take unpaid leave if I want to study full-time, and, well, I don't think I could afford to support myself with no salary for a whole year. Mm, OK. Well, you have two other possibilities. You could either do the part-time course, that would be over two years, and you wouldn't have to take any time off work, or you could do what we call a modular course. You could do that in 18 months if you wanted, or longer. It's quite flexible, and it would be up to you. Hmm. Uh, so what does the part-time course involve? For that, you would join an evening class and have a lecture twice a week. Then you'd have to attend a seminar or discussion workshop one weekend a month. What kind of coursework would I have to do? Well, it's a mixture. You'd be expected to write an essay each month, which counts towards your final assessment. You have a case study to do by the end of the course, which might involve doing a survey or, or something like that. And also you need to hand in a short report every four weeks. So that's quite a lot of work then, on top of working every day. It sounds like a lot of studying and really tiring. Yeah, you certainly wouldn't have much free time. What about the modular course? What would I have to do for that? Well, that's where you get the opportunity to study full-time for short periods. That way you can cover a lot of coursework and attend lectures and seminars during the day. And each module lasts for one term, say, about 12 weeks at a time. There are obvious advantages in this, the main one being that you can study in a much more intensive way, which suits some people much better. And how many of these modules would I have to do to get the diploma? The current programme is two modules, and then you have to choose a topic to work in more depth. But you can base that on your job, and so you don't need to be away from the office. And how long it takes is up to you. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that you don't have to study and work. You can focus on one thing at a time. Yes, I can see that. It certainly sounds attractive. It would be more expensive, though. I mean, I'd have to support myself without pay for each module. Mm -hmm, that's true, so that might be a problem for you. Look, why don't you talk this over with your employers and then come back... Exercise 12. OK, so we've been looking at the attitudes of various social and cultural groups towards the management of their personal finances, how important they feel it is to save money, and what they save their money for. One aspect that we haven't yet considered is gender. So if we consider gender issues, we're basically asking whether men and women have different attitudes towards saving money, and whether they save money for different things. Back in 1928, the British writer George Bernard Shaw wrote in his Intelligent Women's Guide to Socialism and Capitalism that a man is supposed to understand politics, economics, and finance, and is therefore unwilling to accept essential instruction. He also said, a woman, having fewer pretensions, is far more willing to learn. Now, though these days people might question a lot of the assumptions contained in those statements, recent research does suggest that there are some quite fundamental differences between men and women in their attitudes to economic matters. Let's look at what men and women actually save for. Research studies of women in North America have found that women are far more likely to save for their children's education, and they are also more likely to save up in order to buy a house one day. The same studies have found that men, on the other hand, tend to save for a car, which, by the way, takes a surprisingly large amount of the household budget in North America. But the other main priority for men when saving money is their retirement. When they're earning, they're far more likely to put money aside for their old age than women are. Now, this is rather disturbing, because, in fact, the need for women to save for their old age is far greater than for men. Let's consider this for a moment. To start with, it is a fact that throughout the world, women are likely to live many years longer than men, so they need money to support them during this time. Since women are likely to be the ones left without a partner in old age, they may therefore have to pay for nursing care because they don't have a spouse to look after them. 
Furthermore, the high divorce rates in North America are creating a poverty cycle for women. It is the divorced women who will most often have to look after the children, and thus they need more money to look after not just themselves, but others. So, what can be done about this situation? The population in North America is likely to contain an increasing number of elderly women. The research indicates that at present, for women, it takes a crisis to make them think about their future financial situation. But of course, this is the very worst time for anyone to make important decisions. Women today need to look ahead, think ahead, not wait until they're under pressure. Even women in their early twenties need to think about pensions. For example, and with increasing numbers of women in professional positions, there are signs that this is beginning to happen. Then research also suggests that women avoid dealing effectively with their economic situation because of a lack of confidence. The best way for them to overcome this is by getting themselves properly informed, so they are less dependent on other people's advice. A number of initiatives have been set up to help them do this. This college, for example, is one of the educational institutions which offers night classes in money management, and increasing numbers of women are enrolling on such courses. Here, they can be given advice on different ways of saving. Many women are unwilling to invest in stocks and shares, for instance, but these can be extremely profitable. It is usually advised that at least seventy percent of a person's savings. Should be in low-risk investments, but for the rest, financial advisors often advise taking some well-informed risks. Initiatives such as this can give women the economic skills and knowledge they need for a comfortable, independent retirement. The increasing proportion of elderly women in the population is likely to have other economic consequences. Exercise thirteen. Good morning, North College Library. How can I help you? I was wondering if it was possible to join the library. Are you a student at North College? No, I'm not. But someone told me it was possible to join, even if I wasn't. That's right. It is. Are you over eighteen? That's our minimum joining age. Yes, I am. That's no problem then. Could you tell me what I have to do to join? Well, you'll need to come into the library and fill out some forms. You'll also need to bring two passport photos with you. We also need two documents for ID, so a driving license would be fine. I've got that. And what else? A credit card? No, it needs to have your address on it. Shall I bring a bank statement? Would that do? That'll be fine. Good.、Uh, does it cost anything to join? Well, it's free for students here, but otherwise it's one hundred and twenty-five pounds per year, or twenty-five pounds if you've got a current student card from another college. I was at Westerly College until last year, but now I've got a job at Jefferson Steel Factory.、Um, it's more expensive than I thought. My local library is free. But you'll find they don't have the range of reference books or facilities which we buy for our students. That's why you have to pay to be an external member. I see.、Um, how many books can I borrow? We allow twelve items borrowed at any one time if you're a student, and that includes CDs, DVDs, and videos. However, it's only eight items for members of the public. Fine. And how long can I have them for? Well, you can have both fiction and reference books for four weeks, which isn't bad, really. And what happens if I return them late? Like all libraries, there's a fine system in place. The minimum fine is one pound fifty. But it can be much higher for some items, up to five pounds per week. We'll give you a booklet with all the details when you join. You can always renew items if they're not required by anyone else by telephoning or logging onto our website. What about the computers? Can I use them free of charge? For college students, it's free. But for external members like yourself, the first hour is free, and then we make a nominal charge of one pound per hour thereafter. Do I have to book in advance for them? Oh yes, it's advisable. Most people tend to book twenty-four hours in advance, although sometimes you can get one with only six hours' notice. However, the earliest you can book a computer is forty-eight hours before you need it, and you can only book one hour at a time.
If no one else has booked the computer out, then you may be able to have another hour if you want. We have a wide range of databases, so the computers are in great demand. I'm thinking of doing some writing, and I might need to access national newspapers. Do you have them on these databases? We do indeed. We've got all the big nationals, the Guardian and the Observer, the Independent, and the Times and Sunday Times. We've also got all the local papers and a wide selection of magazines. Excellent.、Um, I assume you have photocopying facilities. Of course, five pier sheet for both A4 and A3 black and white copies, and forty pier sheet for colour. You can get a card from the counter here. It doesn't take coins. Okay. Oh, by the way, another thing I was wondering about was if you ran any writing classes through the library. We do, but you'll have to speak to John Grantingham about that. He's our resident author. He runs the creative writing classes. John Grant,、uh, could you spell that for me, please? Certainly, G R A N T I N G H A M. Are the classes here at the library? Yes, he's here on Thursday evenings. Oh, no, sorry. Friday. He's just changed it. You can contact him by emailing the library. Okay, right. Well, that's about all I need to know. Thank you. I'll be along later this week to join. Thanks. Bye. Exercise fourteen. My name's Dan Pearman, and I'd like to talk about the work of Pedal Power, a small charity based mainly in the UK. I'll be giving our contact details at the end if anyone would like to find out more about how to support us. But first, how the charity began. I got the idea of exporting bicycles to developing countries while I was in Ecuador. I went there in 1993, just after graduating from university. After three years of studying, I wanted adventure. I loved traveling, so I decided to join a voluntary organization. And was sent to Ecuador to carry out land surveys. The project came to an end after five years, and when I returned to the UK in 1998, I started planning Pedal Power. Where I lived in Ecuador was a very rural area. My neighbour had the only bicycle in the village, whereas everyone else walked everywhere. My neighbour's business was unusually successful, and for years I couldn't understand why. Then I realized having a bike meant he could get where he wanted to go without much trouble. Other local carpenters could only accept jobs in a three-kilometer radius, so no matter how skilled they were, they could never do as many jobs as my neighbor. At Pedal Power, we collect second-hand bikes in the UK and send them to some of the poorest regions in the world. When we distribute bikes overseas, we don't give them away for free. We'd like to. But long term, that doesn't really help the local economy. The demand for bikes is enormous, which makes them very expensive locally. So we sell them for five percent of the normal price. But in order to continue operating, we need to have a constant supply of bikes, which we send out every six months. One example of a town that's received bicycles from Pedal Power is Rivas. It was the first place I sent a full container of bicycles to. Most people there now own a bicycle. The local economy has developed so much you wouldn't recognize it as the same place. In fact, there are more bikes than on the streets of Amsterdam if you've ever been there. But pedal power still needs your help. You may have read about some of our recent problems in the British media. In August 2000, we simply ran out of money. We had containers of bikes ready to send, but no money to pay the bills. It was a terrible situation. We managed to ensure the bikes went out on time, but the other problems carried on for several months. Fortunately, in October 2001, we won an Enterprise Award, which helped us enormously. We invested 15 of the 75,000 pound prize money to help secure our future. Winning the award helped raise our profile, and the money enabled us to pay all our shipping costs. Which represent our greatest expense. Pedal power changes lives. When someone gets a bicycle from us, they see a 14% increase in their income. We're currently looking to invest in computers 
so that our office staff can do an even better job. Because of our work, people in a number of countries now have a better standard of living. So far, we've provided 46,000 people with bikes, but we'd like to send more, at least 50,000 by the end of the year. Now, there are many ways in which you can support the work of Pedal Power, not just by taking a bike to a collection in your area. I should also like to say, if you do have a bike to donate, it doesn't matter what condition it's in. If we can't repair it, we'll strip it down for spare parts. Of course, to do that, we always need tools which are expensive to buy, so we welcome any that you can give. Also, you could help by contacting the voluntary staff at our offices. They'll be able to suggest activities you could organise to bring in funds for us. People do all kinds of things, including, of course, sponsored bike rides. Also, we're always interested to hear of other places that would benefit from receiving a consignment of bikes and welcome suggestions from people who've been to developing regions on their travels. We hope that by talking on radio programmes like this, we will be able to raise public awareness, which will lead to government organisations also giving us regular financial support, something that we really need. If you'd like some more information about where to donate an old bicycle or offer help in other ways, please contact us. Exercise 15 First of all, I'd just like to say, Christina and Ibrahim, that I really enjoyed watching your video about student life last week. And I could see that the rest of the group did too. You did really well, and I hope that you got a lot out of it. I'd like to use this tutorial as a feedback session where you reflect on the experience of doing the project. So, Christina, I was wondering, what did you enjoy most about making the video? I liked using the camera. Is it the first time you've operated one like that? Yes, it is. Well, the results were very good. Anything else? I also enjoyed visiting one of the British students we filmed. I'd never been inside a British home before. OK, Christina, thanks. Uh, what about you, Ibrahim? What did you enjoy? Well, for me, it was a very good chance to get to know students who are on other courses because everyone in our group is studying English and we don't usually have much to do with the rest of the college. Yes, good. Do you think you'll maintain the contact now? Well, I hope so. I've invited three of them to have dinner with me next week. Great. If you haven't decided what to make yet, I can tell you they'll love trying Arab dishes. And, of course, it's good for your English, too. Uh, Christina, what did you find? What was the most useful aspect of the project from the point of view of the English practice? I think when we were being shown how to edit the film, we had to follow the instructions, and that was very good practice for me. And I also learned some technical words that I hadn't heard before. Hmm. What about you, Ibrahim? What was the most useful for your English? It was listening to the British students because they don't speak as slowly as most of the tutors on our course. I think they speak at natural speed, so it forces me to get used to it. And they use a lot of slang. So you learn some new words which will be useful? Yes. Good. I'm glad it helped. Well, we've talked a little bit about enjoyment and about language practice. Were there any other benefits? What else did you feel you'd learn from the project? Was it useful in other ways? Yes. Well, firstly, I learned how to use a video camera. Mm -hmm. And also, I think I really learned a lot about working together with other people. I've never done anything with a group before, and we had to find ways of cooperating um, and compromising and sometimes persuading people when they don't agree with you. Yes, that is a very useful experience, I know. What about you, Ibrahim? Well, I think I learned a lot about how important editing is. When you're filming, you think that everything's going to be interesting, but in fact we cut around half of it in the end, and then it was much better. Good. Well, one last thing I'd like to ask. What mistakes do you think you, as a group, that is, made? I mean, to put it another way, if you had to do it all over again, is there anything you'd do differently? We didn't plan very well. For example, we didn't decide on dates when we'd complete each separate step of the project, and we should have agreed about that in the beginning, because we were always late with everything. Right. Anything else? 
I think we should have tried to experiment more with the camera. I mean, with angles and the focus and that kind of thing. So you should have been more ambitious. Do you agree, Ibrahim? Not really. In fact, I think we were too ambitious. We were inexperienced and we didn't have a lot of time, and we tried to do too much to make a long film.、Mm. Next time, I would make a shorter one and try to get the quality better. Well, that's very interesting. Next semester, we will be doing another video project with a different content, of course. But you'll have an opportunity to put into practice what you've learned this time. Do you have any ideas about?、Uh, different... Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about that remarkable continent, Antarctica. Remote, hostile, and at present uninhabited on a permanent basis. For early explorers, it was the ultimate survival contest. For researchers like me, it remains a place of great intellectual challenge, while for the modern tourist, it's simply a wilderness of great beauty. First, some facts and figures: Antarctica is a place of extremes, the highest, coldest, and windiest continent, and over 58 times the size of the UK. The ice cap contains almost 70 percent of the world's fresh water. And ninety percent of its ice, but with very low snowfall, most of the continent technically falls unbelievably into the category of desert. Huge icebergs break off the continent each year, while in winter half the surrounding ocean freezes over, which means its size almost doubles. Research and exploration has been going on in Antarctica for more than two hundred years. And has involved scientists from many different countries, who work together on research stations. Here, science and technical support have been integrated in a very cost-effective way. Our Antarctic research program has several summers-only stations and two all-year-round ones. I was based on one of the all-year-round ones. The research stations are really self-contained communities of about twenty people. There's living and working space, a kitchen with a huge food store, a small hospital, and a well-equipped gym to ensure everyone keeps fit in their spare time. The station generates its own electricity and communicates with the outside world using a satellite link. Our station, zero one, had some special features. It wasn't built on land, but on an ice shelf, hundreds of meters thick. Supplies were brought to us on large sledges from a ship 15 kilometers away at the ice edge. Living in the Antarctic hasn't always been so comfortable. Snow buildups caused enormous problems for four previous stations on the same site, which were buried and finally crushed by the weight. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but these buildings became a huge challenge to architects, who finally came up with a remarkable solution. The buildings are placed on platforms, which can be raised above the changing snow level on legs which are extendable. Food is one of the most important aspects of survival in a polar climate. People living there need to obtain a lot more energy from their food, both to keep warm and to undertake heavy physical work. Maybe you know that an adult in the UK will probably need about 1,700 kilocalories a day on average. Someone in Antarctica will need about 3,500, just over double. This energy is provided by foods which are high in carbohydrate and fat. Rations for field work present an additional problem. They need to provide maximum energy, but they must also be compact and light for easy transport. Special boxes are prepared, each containing enough food for one person for twenty days. You may be familiar with coffee processed by freeze drying, which preserves the quality of the food product while making a large saving in weight. Well, this type of presentation is ideal in our situation. It wasn't available to earlier polar explorers, 
whose diet was commonly insufficient for their health. I think that being at the cutting edge of science has a special appeal for everyone working in Antarctica, in whatever capacity. As a marine biologist, my own research was fascinating, but it's perhaps climate change research that is the most crucial field of study. Within this general field, surveying changes in the volume and stability of the ice cap is vital, since these may have profound effects on world sea levels and on ocean currents. A second important area is monitoring the size of the hole in the ozone layer above Antarctica, since this is an indicator of global ultraviolet radiation levels. Thirdly, bubbles in the ice sheet itself. Provide an index of pollution, because frozen inside them are samples of previous atmospheres over the past 500,000 years, and these provide us with evidence for the effects of such human activities as agriculture and industry. There are an increasing number of opportunities for young people to work for a period in Antarctica, not only as research assistants in projects like mine. But also in a wide range of junior administrative and technical positions, including vacancies for map makers. I hope that the insights I've provided will encourage you to take up these opportunities in this fascinating continent.